All right, we are now live on Facebook. All right, thank you all for joining us this evening and uh, welcome to Faith in the Valley's uh, Justice Lecture Series. Uh, my name is Bryson White and I'm the Regional Faith Coordinator for Faith in the Valley. Uh, Faith in the Valley is a faith-based social justice organization that organizes with our communities across uh, the Central Valley towards justice and equity. Uh, Faith in the Valley's Justice Revival Series, which you are uh, here listening to this evening, is an opportunity for Valley residents to hear from, from leading voices in academia, as well as organizers and activists to gain a better understanding about the intersections of oppressions in which vulnerable populations exist. Furthermore, we seek to not only deconstruct, but to invite people into the work of racial and economic justice for the promotion of community healing. This is our second lecture. The first, uh, we heard from Dr. Reggie Williams of McCormick Theological, Theological Seminary, who explored the aesthetics of whiteness and how this is mapped upon the, onto the world in a way that creates death worlds for black persons. Today, we have the pleasure to hear from Professor Najiba Saeed, who is an academic and community organizer, uh, who, who's going to help us explore models of justice that place agency and power in the hands of community and how, and how have faith-based organ, organizations and entities created programs that reclaim healing, conflict resolution, and community-based violence prevention. Just a brief note of order before we turn our evening over to Professor Saeed. Now, we will hear first from Professor Saeed, and then we will reserve time for the last 20, 20 minutes um, of conversation for questions and answers. So please place your questions in the chat, and we will do our best to get to the most pertinent of questions. So uh, yeah, so sit down, listen, and I hope uh, you all have a great experience listening to the wisdom of uh, Dr. Professor uh, Najiba Saeed. Uh, Dr. I'm so delighted. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. White. I was just wondering if I'm able to share my screen. It says that the host has disabled screen sharing, so I need to be able to share my screen. Let's work that out really quick. Let's see. I'm not a host. Try it again. I, I allowed participants to share screen. Great, so are you able to see my screen now? Okay, wonderful. So what I wanted to talk about today was to give us a sense of the options that we have for um, communities to engage, take ownership and have processes that they develop for uh, justice both within their own communities, as well as reduce the engagement that they have on punitive as well as policing forces, um, whatever they may be um, within different settings. So this comes out of <laughs> two decades of work in this area and particularly um, kind of the trajectory of restorative justice itself. So, um, when we think about the, the idea of restorative justice, it finds its um, origin from multiple sources. And many of us are familiar with the form of restorative justice that we um, derive or come from sources such as the peace churches as they're called. Um, I went to a Quaker college for that reason. I chose a Quaker college for um, the exploration of nonviolence, consensus building, um, and the history is very long within many of the peace churches from um, the original sort of abolitionist movement here in the United States. So we um, look at the Mennonite tradition, uh, Quaker traditions, and others. So one of the reasons I'm, I'm using that sort of faith or spiritually based lens because 
it isn't a new <laughs> it isn't a new concept to think about justice in the hands of community members and ownership and accountability um, in terms of how communities address harm. So many of us know the work of um, of Howard Zare, and I just wanted to point out um, some of the sort of the foundational work that he did um, and articulated sort of three pillars of restorative justice. And the first was that harm is more important that, than rules. So when people get hurt, instead of jumping into the justice part of retribution, that we consider meeting their needs as a first priority so that addressing the harm is more important than relying merely on procedure and execution of process. So when I was in law school, there was a lot, this is 20 something years ago, the emphasis was really on looking at um, criminal procedure, civil procedure, what does that process look like? And this was at that time, the beginning of restorative justice in terms of its integration into the criminal justice system. So I was actually trained in 1999 in restorative justice and an alternative. So that's sort of one of the main pillars. The next is that harm creates um, obligations so that those who are responsible for harm um, are responsible to make things right. So we use this terminology and you can see sort of the theological basis for it, the idea of right relationship with one another, making things right, obligation um, in terms of addressing when one has created a form of harm. And last of all, I mean, there's books, there are multiple books, and I would encourage you to read his literature um, and the generations of, of literature that have come after him, is it's really important to involve those who have a stake in the resolution. And this is uh, really a recognition that a community, when, you know, when someone is harmed, that the community bears responsibility in addressing the harm, but also asking why the harm happened. And um, I think depending on how, this is really, this is really the foundation, the third um, pillar for further um, analysis in other generations of scholarship that we'll be talking about that extended the notion of who has a stake in the resolution. Um, Zare's model really looks at kind of the community as defined by two parties, the person who committed the harm and the person who was a recipient of the harm. And so further generations of scholarship extend that. So um, if you're familiar with the work of Fania Davis, she really, in her book, The Little uh, Book of Race and Restorative Justice, um, speaks really powerfully to this notion that, um, as she says, just as the restorative justice community has historically failed to adopt a racial or social justice stance, few racial justice activists embrace restorative justice. Calling for a convergence of the two, the book urges racial justice advocates to invite more healing energy into their lives and restorative justice advocates to bring more warrior energy into theirs. So uh, Ms. Davis informs us in such a way that we can't consider justice and even an alternative or an engagement for an existing system that we know incarcerates and polices, particularly, um, particularly um, those in our communities um, of African American origin, that we have to talk about race. We have to have a conversation about race, that if you're building a restorative justice system, it has to acknowledge the historical racism that exists within the justice system. And I wanted to encourage you, I've just finished teaching a book to my graduate students called um, Colorizing Restorative Justice that is critical of practitioners that were unable to engage issues of racism and restorative justice. So we have to be very careful that restorative justice is not a panacea that is utilized um, for all types of conflicts or that it is imposed in a process that does not recognize the history of racism within our justice and policing system. Um, Ms. Davis goes on to say that restorative justice is a justice that heals. You could say that our justice system harms people who harm people to show that harming people is wrong. And what happens? What happens is that harm replicates, it re reproduces, it it metastasizes, it begins to saturate our existence. 
that so much of what we see around us. That is what in part has bred the abomination of mass incarceration in the prison industrial complex. So Ms. Davis really uh, gives us the tools to think about that third pillar that Zaire introduced, who has a stake in the resolution. So Ms. Davis in her work in schools in Oakland, as well as um, across the country, uh, I would encourage you if you're, if you're running uh, programs with youth, if you are developing any ministry or any types of organizations or after school programs, or you work within any school system, her work is very helpful because what she's able to say is that it's, it's not just that we're looking for an alternative to retributive justice, the eye for the eye. She's saying, what do we do when the imposition of harm is our actual justice system? And that the basis, and many of us could think about the theological basis for why a justice system harms um, or teaches teaches a reduction of harm through the imposition of harms on, um, and as she says, particular bodies and communities, that that justice system um, informs, um, in fact, creates more harm. So we see in Ms. Davis's work and the scholarship of others, this interrogation of the notion that uh, restorative justice is a neutral process or that it's a mere alternative. And um, in colorizing restorative justice, many of the practitioners of color and restorative justice mentioned that one of the problems that has developed is we see restorative justice as an alternative method that's used instead of integrated into the culture of an organization, integrated into the culture of a school or a whole school. And in fact, it should be um, a concept that isn't utilized only when we're looking for an alternative, but it needs to be built and created and engaged um, more in um, whatever uh, context we're in. So then we move into Mia Mingus's work and Miriam Kaba's around transformative justice. And uh, many of you have probably been exposed to transformative justice. So I'm sort of outlining different models. Transformative justice is a political framework and approach for responding to violence, harm, and abuse. At its most basic, it seeks to respond to violence without creating more violence and or engaging in harm reduction to lessen the violence. Transformative justice can be thought of making things right, getting in right relationship or creating justice altogether. So here we see a continuation of some of the language that we um, have been talking about from the beginning of this conversation. Transformative justice responses and interventions, um, again, they move beyond just an alternative justice system to an alternative policing system, or even thinking about policing and reimagining that notion um, that we don't rely on, you know, transformative justice practitioners do not rely on the state. Each, for example, police prisons in the criminal justice system, ICE, the foster care system, although some, um, as we see in Ms. Mingus's work, that some uh, responses do incorporate social services like counseling. Another sort of pillar of transformative justice is that it does not reinforce or perpetuate violence such as oppressive norms or vis vigilantism. And most importantly, it actively cultivates the things we know to prevent violence, such as healing, accountability, resilience, and safety for all involved. I think one of the things that's really important about Ms. Davis's work and um, transformative justice is that the idea of safety is reframed. The idea of uh, harm as happening from just individual actors against someone else, integrating an analysis of how the state uh, can play a role in uh, whether it's through its existing justice system, mass incarceration, disproportionate effect um, on certain communities. In addition to that, other um, uh, there's this um, notion of criminal. Uh, crimmigration right now, the idea of the tie of immigration to uh, a, a hyper criminalization. So using the immigration system as a tool for that as well. And I think, um, I think it's important to keep in mind that there are many ways to think about how we engage in analysis of harm and that one of the things transformative justice brings to the table is the notion that what do you do when systems of policing engage in forms of harm and particularly 
when one is from those communities that have experienced that disproportionate harm. So I, I wanted to kind of propose a set of questions because I think it's, it's not really um, looking at this both as a practitioner and as an academic, it's not only that one of these is the right answer or that there's one way to approach these um, types of conflicts. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. I think um, one of the things we talk about in conflict resolution is you want to have an appropriate intervention um, for whatever the conflict is that you're utilizing. So some of the perpetual questions that come up and I'm going to integrate kind of a faith-based or spiritually based approach in our analysis is what do we do, I think um, in particular about past harms so um, in the restorative justice, in some restorative justice models, the only harm that is acknowledged is the harm that has been done within a particular case. Um, what do we do when communities have experienced harm um, at the hands of the state or at the hands of one another? How do we negotiate? How do we integrate those conversations of past harm? who is accountable for those past harms, who is responsible for those past harms. We have a statewide commission right now on reparations and who is included in the definition of whatever that harm is, is a legal question actually. Who is able, if we get to the point of reparations and reparations are uh, actually um, some, is a, are a tool that have been utilized in multiple cases, not just in this particular one, um, that the statewide commission is looking at, but who who is a who is in that definition of you know not just how do you how do you quantify or operationalize a past harm, but who is who is in that category of people who are affected? Going going back to that third pillar of Zaire, who is a stakeholder within that? So I think that's a perpetual question: how far back, who is responsible, who is and what does that past harm? What do you also do when the harm is um, what we call a dignity violation where there may not be a quantifiable uh, way to measure it, but it is clearly has an impact uh, sociologically, psychologically and otherwise. And so I just wanted to point that out that part of the spiritual intervention in this work is maybe asking those questions. What is the psychological harm? What is the spiritual what, what was the harm done? And also what are the spiritual tools to engage in conversations around transformation? Another, um, another question that's perpetual is um, how do we define the present harm? And I have a couple of uh, items that I put up here that have come up, particularly in the past year, I've been working more um, within the within the sphere of, of government. And one of the things that we find is difficult is, for instance, I was working with communities that were visibly religious and targeted because of their background and their religious identity. And so, you know, that's, um, that can be very difficult. So um, one community, for instance, was very upset when enhancements for prosecution such as hate crimes were removed because they had fought for decades to have the community that was disproportionately targeted because of their religious identity. Um, this is a question, what do we do? It, it kind of, it, it's a question of retributive and restorative justice, but also our alternatives for, do we get rid of these special categories of crimes like hate crimes, when it may be that a religious community does rely on the state for the implementation of those. So I do think that's a, a question we need to ask and explore and understand where people are coming from. Um, this has also come up within the intimate partner violence setting um, models that have utilized um, educators and interveners um, that work in collaboration, for instance, with law enforcement. So what does it look like when there are individuals, when there are communities, when there are circumstances where reliance um, on a form of either policing or justice um, comes up. How do we deal with these multiple interests, these multiple stakeholders with an understanding that we are looking for the community to take as much capacity for responsibility? The other question that comes up on a regular basis are the sources of harm. Um, what are the sources of harm? Um, I'll just give you a quick example of the first restorative justice case I did. 
uh, when I moved to Los Angeles in 2000, I think within the first couple of years. And uh, I walked into a room, this case is kind of like burned on my mind. And there was a young boy, not even, he wasn't even nine years old and his feet could not touch the ground of the, of, he was sitting in a chair and his feet couldn't touch the ground. And it just really hit me that here I am coming into, he's already been touched by the criminal justice system. This is a diversion. So I'm, you know, doing a restorative justice process so that we can divert his, uh, divert his crime out of the system. He, it will still be the record of it will be there, but he would not receive punishment. So uh, the situation that we were dealing with when I came in was he had taken some money from the ice cream truck that came to his neighborhood. And we were able, because it was a restorative process, to bring together the woman who owns the ice cream truck and this young boy. And I'm, I was sitting there um, doing the mediation process. And I was struck with, you know, asking him, well, why, you know, what, what, what led you to take this money? And he said, well, I was hungry that day. So to me, the source of harm that's interpreted in a restorative system of a traditional notion would be that this boy took something, that's the harm that he did to the ice cream truck owner. The question I was asking is, well, what is the bigger harm here? Why is this young child not have the food to eat? Is that not a source of harm as well? And how are we expanding that notion of the community engagement on the larger harm of a nine-year-old boy trying to be able to feed himself in that moment? What is that source of harm? What and how did he reach that point? And how and are the economic systems, I don't know his neighborhood, but what are the economic systems that kept him and his family out of the capacity for engaging in, um, in, in, um, in a viable uh, way? And I think that's a really important question. So it, you, we need to interrogate and continue to ask, ask that question of what the sources of harm are. To finish up that story, um, this young boy, um, it was really quite incredible because what came out of that conversation was the ice cream truck owner said, you know, I would, I really love this boy. He is someone that I care about. And the young boy said, I care about the ice cream truck owner. We know each other. And they came up with a resolution where he, well, he spent some time with her after school learning how to sell ice cream. And it was a really beautiful resolution because what it did is it allowed for the person who was impacted by the harm to be an agent of healing. And it was really powerful. And that case more than 15 years ago now, I've seen it, I have seen that dynamic again and again, that when you're able to bring people together, they're able to talk about um, resolutions, particularly in this case with a young boy that allowed for him to take agency and ownership, not just over harm, but over, uh, a capacity for healing. We'll talk about healing justice a little bit. Um, and so I think the other question you want to ask is who is the facilitator? Um, do they have, and this is from the Colorizing Restorative Justice text and other books, we want to bring in facilitators that don't perpetuate harm, that don't continue harm. So if they are not aware of the history of your community, if they're not aware of the past harms that communities carry, um, they can actually continue harm or maybe even impose more harm. And I think we also have to have a, a, a sort of a conversation about what are the processes that we use depending on the conflict. And we'll come back to that later. What does the process look like? Is it something that we integrate into the court system? Is it an alternative? How do we think about the role of faith actors in that as well? So we'll speak a little bit about that. Um, the last thing that I wanted to kind of, a question that frames all of the three models that we've talked about in the fourth model is, how do we come to this work? Um, do we come to it with an abolitionist perspective? Do we come to it with a reform perspective? And I think there's a versus there. I do feel like um, because I've been in the reality of having to do this work um, you know, day to day, um, in and out, is that we can have an academic, idealistic, uh, theological conversation about elimination of harm. And then many of us are left in the day to day, um, figuring out how do we actually implement? How do we move forward? And so I don't think, I just wanted to caution us that I don't think it's a versus. I don't think it's a you know, uh, one camp against the other. I would encourage us to try to have conversations. 
to understand that the pragmatic basis of current harm needs to be addressed. So whatever your long-term goal is, certainly thinking about ways to address it. And then in, in the immediate day-to-day, -day, there are, as I mentioned in this one case and many others, young people as well as others that need diversion from a system that will capture them um, for their lifetime um, in really negative ways. So I would love to think about ways to minimize that harm in the moment. So, but I do think that that is a ideological, theological, um, if you're not religious, it's a question of uh, methodology of your approach to this work. I just wanna, I feel like it shuts down a lot of conversations and I want us to kind of figure out ways to frame the conversation where it isn't um, either or, but also thinking through how we are very pragmatic in the moment for people who are experiencing current harm. So um, I wanted to introduce also this idea of healing justice and something that is helpful um, to keep in mind is that these terminologies have different homes. I've also utilized heal healing justice um, uh, from the work of uh, other scholars who have also traced it to um, different communities and practices all over the world. So this is not only an American concept. This is healing justice is found in many communities, particularly um, looking at the scholarship, um, for instance, um, through the Colorizing Restorative Justice book that I talked about and other scholars who trace indigenous practices around healing justice as integrated into peace cultures or cultures that are able to generate methods of peace building within the very way that they are formed and the way that children are socialized. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on that. I just wanted to point out that none of these concepts are new. Many of them have existed in our communities. They have been around. It's just being able to systematize them and articulate them in a vernacular that people can understand. So uh, Prentice Hemphill's work has been really important in the area of healing justice and, and Prentice mentions um, the work of Kara Page that I also wanted to point out and Kindred's Southern Healing Justice Collective, Collective that cleared a path and told us that healing justice identifies how we can holistically respond to and intervene on generational trauma and violence, again, the past harm that we talked about um, and to bring collective practices that can impact and transform the consequences of oppression on our, our bodies, minds, and hearts. Prentice goes through and has articulated um, kind of foundations of healing justice, of which I've shared just one here, which is that healing justice means that these interventions and so many more not yet imagined can no longer be pushed to the margins of our work, but must be central and given our attention and time. We heal so that we can act and organize. And I, I that particular sentence is very powerful because I think there can be this idea that healing, again, as some of the literature on restorative justice is a neutral process, that everyone enters it, everyone is responsible, has the same level of agency and capacity and access to resources. I think uh, Prentice's work is really important because it attaches to the notion of healing, the idea of organizing. And to me, as someone who does community organizing right now in the labor setting, Organizing is important because it empowers a community to continue the process of accumulating the resources for responding to injustice. And to me, that is a helpful kind of marriage between the notion of healing and the notion of justice. So that ultimately, not only do we want to create uh, systems of justice that uh, minimize harm, um, that eliminate harm, but one day could actually promote healing. So that's where I think the spiritual and faith-based communities can be really powerful here because we integrate conversations and ideas um, from our practices, from our traditions that don't look at the human being from merely a transactional standpoint, that have concepts, for instance, from the Jewish tradition, I was just talking to my students about that, that talk about collective responsibility, community-based responsibility, the responsibility of a whole community to take on accountability for something that has happened. So just as an example from the Jewish uh, traditions, and we'll discuss some others. So some of the spiritual tools, and this is my last uh, piece that I wanted to have us think about, 
as you kind of drill down into your own context is a really, um, I think fundamental question is what is dignity in your tradition? Um, we've been doing uh, and researching a lot more at the international law level around the idea of dignity violations. It used to be that harm was considered a physical harm. How do you quantify the physical harm that someone experiences? What scholars have begun to develop in the literature is this idea of dignity violations and sometimes uh, whether it's a particular state or a system will, for instance, pick out representatives of one community and make examples and violate their dignity so that the dignity, it's essentially this idea of humiliation. We see it now, um, unfortunately, utilized in many cases around the, the world. So what is so what you know what is our definition of dignity? So in for instance the Muslim tradition, dignity is a God-given. Um, it's not an affect, but it's really a condition of the human being. That it's something that uh, karama, the idea of dignity coming from God, that every human has it, and it doesn't differentiate within um, the Muslim scripture that someone has of one background has more dignity than another. If you're doing this kind of job, you have less dignity. If you have this kind of background, if you've committed this crime, your dignity, it's God-given, it's universal. It's um, part of the process in which every uh, fetus is actually visited by God and, and the ruh or this a form of spirit is breathed into this fetus. So each child from birth is comes into the world with God-given dignity. And I think that's really important because what it allows us to do is to see everyone that enters into what we are hoping to create as a healing justice system as equally worthy of a dignity-based process. That what we are creating is uh, a system that endows as well as recognizes and honors the dignity and doesn't violate it, whatever they have done. And I think if being able to think through it in that way so another question you can think about as you drill down into your context again is what elements from scriptures and stories give examples of healing justice? So one of my graduate students um, works at a mosque in South LA and he's come up with this really beautiful way of training um, facilitators in restorative justice in his community um, utilizing examples from prophets, um, different prophets, you know, what were the, healing practices of Jesus? What were the ways in which different scripture and stories give us not just these ideas, and I think that's really important, not just ideas or affects or, you know, notions of, of um, healing, but actually what were the ways in which people utilized um, methods of healing within their community? So some of the ones that I can think about are, um, you know, that the stories that come out of uh, both the Hebrew Bible as well as um, Christian scriptures that talk about this notion that uh, Jesus would physically be proximate to people, for instance, who had leprosy. At that time, how, you know, to be able to sit with folks in such a way that it wasn't just, um, he was physically close to them because in that moment and in that time, that was considered um, not just problematic, but in many ways you were also, it was this element of being cast out from society. And so the holiest place you can be, the most sacred place is to be with people who are cast out by others. That speaks really to this element of being able to play a role in being a personal agent of healing when a system has cast out people. So that we could go on with stories of, of Buddhist traditions, many traditions where uh, both prophets as well as leaders sat with those that were cast out. And that is not, it's not a pity, it's not a charitable notion, it's actually this capacity to show that you can step out of a harmful system into a system that heals through your very embodied empathy. Uh, another question that we can ask ourselves is what principles um, of no harm exist in our cultural ethos and community practice? So sometimes we look at spiritually based practices, but also think about uh, the ways in which diplomacy have developed in your own community. So it could be your ethno-racial community. It could be 
it's not always, it doesn't always, always have to be a religious articulation. So many of us, for instance, um, in our family systems, um, elders play the role of diplomacy and conflict resolution between those that are in conflict. Um, so that's just an example. What are the practices around healing and negotiation and mediation that do exist already? So mapping those out is really powerful because then we begin to see, as I said, these are not new principles. It didn't take a scholar to name them, you know, in the last 30 years. These are integrated into our system. We often have to rediscover them and re-engage them and be able to see um, how we have created within our own communities this capacity for uh, principles of no harm or harm reduction. So some of the, um, you know, if you use these kind of one to four questions, what are some systems of care that we can develop within our own communities? And I, I point that out because I've been really, uh, as I mentioned, blessed to have graduate students who've taken some of the concepts that I've taught back to their churches, their synagogues, their mosques. And so um, what we found is really important is you have to build that capacity in a culturally competent manner so that um, one of the critiques of restorative justice that has come out from practitioners of color is that we can't have one size fits all that you have to really um, have a deeply contextual, elicitive, we would call it from the field of education, a, construction, a constructivist approach that emanates from the knowledge system that already exists in the community. So training is very important. Um, if you're a pastor, if you're a religious leader, are you using the pulpit to bring these conversations um, to talk about dignity, to talk about uh, principles of no harm that exist, to think about elements from our scripture and stories of community that bring um, that knowledge to bear. Um, so another important uh, element of creating systems of care, in addition to training people, whether it's through the pulpit, whether it's through a formal training system that you establish, and I've worked with synagogues, uh, mosques, and churches that have done that, um, is that it's really important that these be interlocking systems of restorative justice, that they're intergenerational. So um, the student that took the work into ISLA um, in South LA developed a restorative circle for the elementary school program that was at the mosque and then trained adults and then um, elders. And so being able to bring, you know, think about this intergenerationally is really important so that we don't isolate and this is what I would think I would offer as a critique of restorative justice programs that often only focus on youth or um, are not able to be intergenerational. And I think that interlocking systems across generations is really important. And um, we can discuss that a, um, a little bit more if we have some time. I think also having an established core of interveners, depending on, again, the source of harm. We've developed um, with different communities programs that particularize, for instance, the harm that happens when there has been a shooting, uh, going to the hospital. There's a core of interveners who know how to work with all of the different families that are impacted to help uh, stem any retaliation. So which core of interveners uh, match the conflict that you are trying to to reduce or eliminate violence. So whether it's in, as I mentioned, that's a very specific area um, around, uh, for instance, the violence that happens in a community and developing those core of interveners. I would say, I would add to that core of interveners, people who can be agents of um, restorative justice on conflicts that don't reach that level of violence because what looks like a, a very complex conflict can often start from a very small interpersonal issue between people. So we've, um, I've seen some communities, for instance, develop mentors who um, help uh, couples through their conflicts with one another. Uh, elders who've been married for a long time, if that's um, the context in which you live, who are, who are mentors because interpersonal violence is, a, is also really, a huge source of communities, a need to rely on outside sources. So are we able to develop those core of interveners for 
the types of conflicts that our communities are facing. Um, I think ongoing capacity building is really important that once you develop systems of care, how do you sustain them? How do you continue to bring in new information, move them forward, keep them moving? Um, and I think it's also important to talk with communities about, well, why, why are we choosing a community-led and based system? Because very often, if you're doing this kind of justice work, you know the statistics, you know that impact, people see it clearly with mass incarceration and other forms of uh, retributive justice that have not been, um, that have not frankly been effective. We need to be able to articulate why being community led is um, not just a value, but has efficacy within and of itself and its impact on a reduction of how people are put into harmful systems um, and so I think that's important to continue to have that conversation. Um, and then I think thinking through um, what are the venues and protocols for conventions? So, so for intervention, so I talked about this idea of hospitals. There are many other forms and places for intervention. Who are your partners? Who calls and asks? So for instance, the, one of the imams that I was working with, religious leaders, he found that um, he, people were asking for restorative justice circles. This is among adults with conflicts with other adults. And then he realized that he needs to be able to have a place where people, he would be going out and doing the, me, doing the mediation. He was saying, you know what? I realize that people have to be able to call. And if they have a conflict with me, who do they go to? So it was this idea of, you know, what do you do if you have a, if you're the source of conflict, but you're also the intervener, like you need to have this capacity for, um, protocols for intervention, who monitors it um, in establishing a police community mediation program in Pasadena. A number of years ago, I worked closely with about six community organizations, which was one of my first academic articles. It was really important for me that we had the Police Assessment Resource Center monitor that program. So you're using facilitation, but we wanted to have a center that was looking at issues of, of uh, making sure that individuals were receiving uh, fair treatment by law enforcement systems. So I think it's really important to think about who monitors these interventions that you do, who intervenes, and who follows up. So those are some of the questions that I think are really important, um, and I hope that some of the examples we were able to bring to the table um, were useful. So I think I think that's it from my. Um, that's it from my um, from my end. So, uh, Bryson, uh, I I'll hand it over to you. Professor, Saeed, thank you so much. That's that's some some really good uh, not just information, but it's really challenging um, us even as an organization for Faith in the Valley. I mean, these are some of the things that we have been recently thinking through as we've been a part of an internal process for a theory of change. And so, I think this is. Uh, your lecture is really helpful for us internally. Uh, and hopefully as we post it and circulate it, others who register to come to here will be able to participate as well. Um, oh, let me start my video. Uh, a question for me, um, one question you said around dignity violations. Would you be able to provide any a, sort of a concrete example of that? Because I, under, I understand sort of in uh, what, you, what you're saying, but I would love like an example of that. Yeah, definitely. So, um, so like some unintentional dignity violations can be when we are offering forms of economic recovery to individuals, but we ask them to stand in line outside. And everyone knows that where they're going in that moment is to receive. And in fact, um, another form of the, in the American um, welfare system, there used to be, and there are still, one could argue, depending on how you interpret the system, um, there would be people who would just come and knock on your door in the middle of the night to see who was in the house, whether they were allowed for um, under the rules or, you know, just this idea of trying to identify people into an association um, with some form of uh, violation to their dignity because it means either everyone has seen what they're struggling with or that the struggle is um, at any moment subject to an intrusion. 
and because it's and I think theologically it's really important for us to keep in mind that um, poverty has been highly criminalized in this society just being poor is somehow seen as less um virtuous and that being wealthy is somehow we've associated in this society this idea that being wealthy shows a higher moral station so those are some of the ways you know I as I was working with relief uh, really some relief workers and they were talking about how handing out relief in international contexts building ways that it didn't have to be people standing in a line getting a check in such a way or getting the you know how do you build systems in which people are allowed some privacy over the vulnerabilities that they're dealing with instead of, and who gets that privacy and who doesn't? That's also a dignity kind of violation. So um, those are just examples you can think of more, but it's the reason I talk about this idea of a line <laughs> is that it's a design issue. It's not that it's a bad thing to give out aid, but it's the way that it's designed and what people have to go through to be able to access it um, becomes an injury. So that's that's a very simple example, but you could think of it as a, as a in a much more complex system. And those um, dignity violations are sometimes perpetuated, um, not against a whole community. There's literature um, and research on humility, uh, sorry, humiliation and how that's done. Sometimes people are made examples of, um, particularly in what we're thinking about now, I'm teaching a course at Union next year on fragile democracies. Um, you know, as authoritarianism goes up, um, it doesn't, you don't have to always go after a whole community. You can pull out a few folks um, who are publicly humiliated in some way or another as an example for the rest of that community that if you do this, this is what will happen. And that's happened a lot in international protests where people are fighting for democracy and they've been publicly um, humiliated in multiple ways. Um, that That's really like really important <laughs> that, 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 that point, like, because I'm thinking about that in the context of community organizing and the way uh, structural powers counter organize freedom movements. And so this notion of humiliation of one or two folks as a way to transpose it onto others is a really is something that I think that even as an organization we need to think about and and, and how that shows up in the Central Valley. Yeah. And that's historical. I mean, we know Dr. King was constantly tailed by the FBI. So I'm pointing out like it's not a new concept. No, yeah. In fact, it predates the United States, the creation of the United States. Um, you can think about some of the tyrants and scriptural um, stories and what and how they how authoritarianism seeks to do that because it's a very efficient form of tyranny is to be able to just build and internalize fear in a community so that they self regulate. And in fact, some of the examples we've seen were um, going after migration activists particularly young activists, I'm speaking from the story in LA, that if you were out there with your voice, it's sort of people will self-deport, self-regulate um, self in a way that is um, replicates what the system is trying to do. So it's not only just violence, but the fear that violence, the fear of the threat, sorry, the threat of violence, if you see examples made of others. So I just want to point that out, that's historically, you look at politics that is also a way that um, has been very efficient so um, it is unfortunately utilized for that purpose because it doesn't take a lot of resources people will then act out of fear and and limit themselves yeah no, that's that's excellent uh, pa uh, uh elizabeth or pastor curtis may have uh, some questions pastor curtis is a bit under the weather so if he has a question he might throw it in throw it in throw it in the chat but it's uh it is 7.31. I mean, I, I want to hear more. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, but. Uh, I mean, it's 10.30 here, so. Yeah, yeah, so I'm going to definitely let you. <laughs> let, 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 so feel free if you want to ask another question, we can um, we can continue. And, and you know, I thank you for. One me. more one more question for you, if somebody else doesn't look like they unmuted. So uh, I really appreciated the point. I wrote a, a just a note around. Um, restorative uh, justice programs only focusing upon youth and how 
typically only focusing upon youth in town, that's maybe sometimes a shortcoming. Um, and, I, and I'm wondering within your own organizing work, how restorative justice amongst adults has, has shown up. Maybe yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It's shown up a lot. Um, I think the problem is that, at least in California, we have not been able to have a uniform restorative justice intervention system. So it's very spotty, it's up to the judge, it's kind of, it just depends. I'm, I'm speaking from Los Angeles, which has one of the, I think the largest court systems. So, um, you know, I was able, for instance, to get, um, I was able to get uh, one case where it was six, uh, 12 girls, six girls from two different um, communities that had a fight on the playground. Um, not a playground, they were high school students. So I guess they had a fight in the yard and they were going to add to that gang enhancement charges, even though no one was gang affiliated. So to yeah. get back to those enhancement issues and the case, everyone was on board, um, the police department, the parents, the lawyers, everyone was ready to move forward with uh, using restorative process instead of a, um, instead of utilizing uh, trial or criminal justice procedures. Unfortunately, from the top um, at that time, uh, we were not able to move forward because of, I think it was a, the DA at, at, the, at the higher level, not the DA at the level that we were dealing with, but higher levels were not comfortable with utilizing that process. So I think that is one of the things that we face um, is the ability to be able to have it not just be at the discretion or take an incredible amount of effort. So there are organizations that are doing this work within schools, there are organizations, Sentinel Services has been doing this work mm -hmm. in Los Angeles for many years. They were the first people that I mediated with. But I do, I do think that for a state as large as California, that there should be a system, systematic approach. Minnesota has a more formal approach um, that has kind of moved across. More, so it is a policy issue. I think this is something that, you know, why don't we have uh, why do we have kind of special courts that will show up like um, drug courts or homelessness courts and then they, you know, depending on who is in that, who is in that um, uh, courthouse or building, you know, how, how permanent are these? I think that's a question that we can ask and how much is up to the discretion and the whim of whomever has that capacity to establish or, or, um, or take away those programs. So I think that is a question that we should ask at the policy level is why isn't there an investment in a statewide approach to restorative justice? Um, and restorative justice, not just as a concept or as a teaching tool, it's restorative practices are very powerful for people um, on the inside and folks who are dealing with multiple issues. I would love to see us have a, a broader, more robust policy agenda that looks at different nodes of entry. So when someone's arrested, there is an intervention that could be restorative when, you know, before someone, and they're just kind of mapping the, the judicial as well as criminal justice system to see where can we build in efficient modes? Because we know the research shows, that's what I was gonna say really quickly when you're asking about adults, the research shows that if you do engage in a restorative process, it actually over time reduces recidivism. So that's why I think we have to be able to speak about these, not just from a moral standpoint, but also from an efficiency standpoint. And that's why you've seen some bipartisan support of uh, alternatives to incarceration. And that was that question I had about the reality of day-to-day -day, like abolition and reform don't have to be, I don't think they have to be at odds with one another all the time. Mm -hmm. Maybe because I'm in the work and seeing folks that are deeply impacted, so. That's right, yeah. I mean, even like Ruth Wilson Gilmore talks about supporting non-reformist reforms, right? You know, so there are some sorts of reforms that <laughs> are, you know, are, are, are beneficial, but yeah. You look like you were about to say something. That's why I stopped. No, that was it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just, I just want to, because I think what happens is, I just feel like um, folks can really get into the abstract, and it's important to think about. I just think about you know, as I'm as I'm going to sleep, who, who could we, who could be kept out of a system? And I, 
I do think that while um, adults are, it's important to engage adults, part of the reason to utilize or to emphasize, particularly with children, is that there are so many other systems that touch children once they become a part of the criminal justice system and um, ones that really are hard to get out of. And um, so I, I feel the urgency there, but I also want us to be careful because I think that getting back to that dignity issue, it's not that children are more deserving of an alternative than adults. And I think that's been the hard sell policy-wise is folks are able to say, well, okay, under the age of 18, do this alternative system. I also wanted to, I was talking about this with my students. There is, there are some um, issues with a restorative justice alternative system. For instance, um, in the Zare model, the person who has committed the harm has to openly admit to guilt. So what do you do when there is a, a policing or a restorative, you know, wherever you are in your context, a justice system that is incarcerating or engaging or pulling aside people that are wrongfully accused. And for them to engage in an alternative, they have to say, admit guilt. I think we have to be really careful there policy-wise because then you can incentivize folks choosing what could be a harmful resolution over the long term. Um, so I think that is something I've also been thinking about too is some of the pillars of restorative justice can also work against some of the, um, yeah, the rights of individuals, um, especially those that don't have adequate representation um, for uh, legal representation in their system mm -hmm. or um, in their capacity to cover um, what what would be adequate representation. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. This, yeah, this, this, this is excellent. I wish, me and Pastor Curtis were um, communicating about. We wish that there are other folks, even from our own team, that were here because you know we do do restorative justice work, and there are you know folks who are doing the work of transformative justice within the organization. So this would have been a very good um, uh, conversation to have, just <laughs> even in, in, internally. And so I think Pastor Curtis said uh, we have to bring uh, Prof. Say back again. Thank you for giving us some direction for our organization as it pertains to restorative justice. So, so that's yeah, absolutely. That's to EB, to, so if you stand, we, we can bring you back. We'll be able to bring you back at some point. <laughs> I'm happy to drill down on the last slide because I have lots of examples of cases I've worked on or programs that have been successful. There have been some great programs in California. Um, I just, I kind of because of the faith part of the faith in the valley, I wanted to make sure we talked about some of the spiritual resources and why, um, you know, I, I worked with a Jewish group here in LA at one point that was training restorative justice mediators. So I think every community um, has some resources. Um, and I, I think the moral, um, the moral voice uh, is really important. Um, and I would just love to see us be able to, without, it doesn't take a lot of resources to do the training and get folks placed into either organizations or even schools or other, you know, places to move the pipeline from an into prison, um, you know, as efficiently as possible. So thank you. Yeah, no, no doubt. Maybe we can, do you want to stop recording and we can keep talking? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we, we, 